Good morning, good morning. Good morning. I'm going to put my windows down because I'm going to... The, uh, it's the first real cold day of the year. As in, I went out and fed my fish and they didn't really want to eat. They've all, they're all dozy, you know. Anyone who keeps goldfish will know that when the temperature gets below about 10 degrees, they, uh, they uh, hibernate. They don't eat anything, they're all winter. They just sit around and just do get cold blooded and the little hearts only beat very slowly. So, and you've got to stop chucking food in because you don't want to poison everything. Anyway, how are you? How are you? I've got so many of these videos piling up. I'm thinking of doing them without the um, car cam footage because uh, that, to be honest with you, that is the problem. The problem is downloading the car cam footage, synchronizing the audio on the car cam footage with the phone footage so that I know uh, that uh, you're looking at the right bit of road as I'm driving along, etc, etc. Hello, what's he doing? Something big's going in or out of there. You see, but it's interesting, isn't it, you see? I mean, I'll keep the car cam going, I suppose, in case I have a crash. But uh, I'm gonna, I'll get so many more of these out if I didn't have to do all the faffing around with the two video feeds. The alternative is to get one camera that does both. In other words, we'll do, I mean, it's got to do a picture of the road, a picture of me, and have decent audio on it, hasn't it? Which is, you know, like, impossible. Oh, look, there's a cabbage picking thing. That's what they do. They pick the cabbages and put them in those yellow baskets. Oh. Bloody... Two strips of rubber across the road. You know what that means, don't you? You know what that means? Two strips of rubber across the road. Pause the video if you don't. It means there's some traffic calming measure is going to be introduced up the road there. Here's another two, look. This, this village, Preston, they're absolutely, absolutely obsessed with speed. They should be more obsessed with pavements and getting public. There's no pavement on the left and there's no pavement on the right, as you can see, for some of it. But if they actually, you know, took some measures to safeguard the public, the pedestrians, then they wouldn't have to... Really, they want to be uh, pedestrian only. Ideally, they would ban cars from Preston High Street altogether. But um, the trouble is, they all drive them. That's the first problem. And the second problem is... It's, it connects Wingham at the south end, here's another one, with um, with, uh, with the A299 at the north end grove and all that. So you, they can't pedestrianise it because the, the diversion would be like 20 miles. Okay? It's always going to be, and they're not going to get a bypass. So what they've done is they've done loads of traffic calming measures. Like They started off with a 30 flashy sign you know but that wasn't enough so then they put in a park car one of those permanent park car type diversions but no they, they got something else up their sleeve mark my words they've got something else up their sleeve it'll be another uh, I don't know it'll be a giveaway you know to oncoming traffic type thing in an attempt to slow slow everything down and I don't think it'll make the slightest bit of difference because the white van man who goes through Preston is not going to pull over for anything. Traffic coming the other way, all door kids coming out of school. Anyway, what should we talk about today? Have you heard the word meta? And if you haven't, you soon will. It's Facebook's decided to brand itself, rebrand itself meta. Not that anyone's on uh, Facebook, but they are still very powerful. They're a bit like um, Sagem or Sagem, S-A-G-E-M. They have a, 
a contract to provide an awful lot of scanners and fingerprint scanners and things for law enforcement and government agencies. And they also produce an absolute crap uh, card reader, which several merchant services offer, uh, old fashioned merchant services. And, um, you know, and they shouldn't be in business because their they're card reader's crap. But because they've got all these government contracts, they're, they're, they're quite a big firm. And uh, there, are, there are loads like this. Other names that you wouldn't even think of, you know, like um, Honeywell are still going. Uh, all they do for the average bloke is produce uh, perhaps a thermostat that keeps uh, controls his central heating. But they've got big business elsewhere. Barclays uh, Bank, for example, is uh, not at all interested in the high street business. It's a big investment bank. It's got in, you know, uh, an investment arm that makes all the money and the high street bank is, is the tail on the dog. But that's why Barclays is, um, and their customer service is not all that, you know. And I know, because I was with Barclays when I qualified and I left them because uh, their, their, their service was rubbish. And, uh, I mean, <laughs> they were my bank all the way through dental school they were my bank when I qualified. They lent me in my final year, or 18 months or so, about 8,000 8, quid. I qualified in 1981 with 8,000 pounds worth of student debt, all owed to Barclays, and all paid back. And when I then went to them and asked them if they would lend me the money to buy my first surgery, they said no. <laughs> they, they're like, they've invested all this time and money in recruiting me at dental school and then when they could have made some really big bucks for me, really big bucks, they're like, um, um, no thanks. <laughs> so that's when I went to HSBC, or Midland Bank as it was at the time, and I've never, you know, that's it, I've been with HSBC ever since. So well done Barclays, you know, but they don't care because they're the tail. The dog is the investment bank, so. Anyway, uh, Meta is, uh, may, may well end up being a big thing, so I just wanted to put down on for the record how it all started. The um, uh, Bitcoin is uh, sprung out of the digital uh, uniqueness, the ability to make a unique digital file. Um, because digital files were known for not being unique, anyone could replicate a digital file perfectly which led to a, you know, this big uh, revolution in music piracy, etc, etc. And, um, and that sort of settled down into a system where you do pay now for your music. You pay $9.99 for Spotify every month and you get access to pretty much every bit of music that there is. So, so you could say almost in a way that Spotify has sort of taken over the music, music piracy business. So they pirate the music for you legally and then you pay them 10 quid a month to play any of the, the pirated music. So Oh god, where was I? This is trouble with my brain. My brain wanders about Meta, Meta, okay, Meta. So what happened was long comes Satoshi Nakamoto 2008 and demonstrates how you can uh, produce a digital file that everybody agrees is unique and everybody agrees is the original and not a copy. So for the first time the concept of digital uniqueness was born and it's a revolution in computer science given the rise to a lot of various uh, applications, um, digital blockchain data, you know, irrevocable recording of data, uh, immutability and um, Hello. The god of traffic lights has favoured me today. He's, he's made the light go green as I approach. Or is he having a laugh? Is he going to make it go red? Well, he made it go red, but it's too late. So, uh, <clears throat> what then happens is that um, uh, people, the, the artist, the artistry industry, that seem to sort of piggyback on everything, uh, because there's a lot of money to be made in art. Um, then, then decided that what they could do is they could try and 
convert their art into in digital form and sell it as a unique digital product okay now what well, you might say well what's the point of having a digital copy of the Mona Lisa that is demonstrably the original and demonstrably the uh, you know okay ver verifiably the original copy if other people can still make copies but they can't make the claim that it is the original digital one but so what they can still have it as a screensaver you know so they can still enjoy it and that is still my problem with the, these things are called non-fungible tokens because they're not fungible in that they're not interchangeable between each other there is only one which is generally acknowledged as as the the one and then there's uh, other copies which are to all intents and purposes identical copies but can't prove that they're the original although they are to all intents and purposes the same as the original so this nfts is a it's a bit of a i'm still struggling with the idea i'm not struggling with the idea that there's a load of there's a bunch of idiots who will pay large amounts of money for the idea of nfts or to own an nft because that is true there are well, there are a lot of you know what they say about a fool on their money are soon parted and there's a lot of idiots um, particularly in uh, in the US who've made a lot of money out of crypto and have uh, trading these NFTs and it all started on the Ethereum blockchain where they were trading uh, cats crypto cats and um, it actually brought the chain to a standstill because uh, Ethereum is supposed to be some sort of uh, decentralized world computer and uh, all its processing power got tied up and all its transaction fees were jacked up by people trading uh, digital cats. So, <laughs> honestly, in the future, you won't believe this, but <laughs> this is the truth. I just hope these things, this one in particular, doesn't get lost. So, so anyway, uh, there's a big trade in NFTs, and uh, people are making and selling these NFTs, and some guy uh, made made a few bits and pieces, like um, in these uh, my, uh, fantasy games, uh, you know, might and magic type games where you wander around and you're a wizard or an elf or something, and you go around and you collect swords and liveries and loot and spells, potions and stuff like that. And um, there was a there was always a a question as to why these things couldn't be cross-platform. In other words, if you spent like 100 hours uh, grinding to get a sword in one game, why can't you uh, use it in another game? And <clears throat> the closest they got was to have a marketplace on Steam where you could, you can buy and sell these things, or even off of Steam. Uh, Steam don't condone it because it means, uh, sometimes it means transferring accounts, you know, and playing with somebody else's account. But um, certainly in the Far East, it's well worth their time sitting there playing a computer game to get some sort of high-level spell, which they can sell. They can then sell you for more than anything else they might be able to sell you. So um, anyway, there's sort of this nascent market in uh, in, in virtual goods, and uh, but still no true portability. So. Anyway, um, then people started uh, designing uh, these swords and outfits and uh, spells and potions as, as uh, people would say, well, what, what game are they designed to be used in? And the answer was, they're not designed to be used in any particular game. They are just a generic, it is just a generic good sword that could be incorporated by the game designer into any game. So anyone who's thinking of, uh, you know, writing a game that involves might and magic and swords and uh, goblins and stuff the swords are already there and technically because the swords are will be owned by the player um, they they might be able to use them in more than one game well what that did was that sparked off the idea this idea of the meta net which is which is the network of things which don't actually belong to anything. It's a sort of a decentralised uh, 
universe of, of various digital goods which are demonstrably unique and therefore can you know you can demonstrate some form of ownership of them um, which um, are created by anybody anywhere in the world and can be owned by anyone anywhere in the world and that is that is to the best of my knowledge that is the word where the word meta came from Meta obviously is still in wide use, and uh, BSV uh, Bitcoin has got a, a network called the MetaNet. But there's there's a lot of Meta everything. Like chemistry's got a lot of Meta chemicals. Meta, you know, is just is not a copyrightable word. It's just a concept of uh, being in the middle or uh, being in between. So, um, but then uh, Facebook, who are not slow to catch on to a, what may be a, like a, you know, a massive trend for decentralised uh, goods and services they have decided to rebrand themselves Meta and I think that's you know for the same reason that Windscale rebranded itself uh, is because they've got a toxic brand and so it doesn't hurt them to rebrand and also um, you know they came up with this absolutely brilliant idea of a of a, their own digital dollar and called it Libra until they were slapped down extremely hard and have now decided to uh, try and facilitate payments between Facebook users uh, using uh, a currency which is uh, DM I think it's called as in Carpe DM since the day Libra was in Libra as in free although most of these dumb Americans didn't realise that Libra was they thought it was the star sign they didn't realise it was the it was the French word because they don't know French and they don't know uh, where France is on the globe couldn't put their finger on it anyway uh, Facebook having been slapped down with Libra then then came up with DM which was which was sort of slightly less of a direct substitute for the dollar you know a bit less of a threat to the US uh, Treasury and uh, Federal Reserve so although I don't know how far they've got with it but um but being uh, based on a basket of currencies, it tends to be, it's more of a, uh, a financial instrument. But, um, so, so Zuckerberg's concentrating on two things. He's concentrating on uh, uh, turning Facebook into not just a, a network for the transmission of ideas and for the transmission of, uh, you know, for the creation and maintenance of uh, relationships between people but also the transfer of money of uh, wealth and assets and um, through his network he's got a network you might as well maximize the value of the network you know? so uh, that's interesting they've got Invicta fire and rescue aviation and event fire cover flood pumping so basically they've got to have a fire They've got to have a fire and rescue team there. So they've decided to um, pimp it out. That's not a bad idea, is it? It's a business idea, I suppose. If they're not doing anything there, they might as well go and stand around at a fate. So, in case anyone says fire to the coconuts. <laughs> So yeah, so DM hasn't done much really either, but I mean, you know, it might it might get somewhere, I don't know. Uh, so, but Facebook is gonna be, but Facebook is like, you know, so like, nobody's on Facebook. It's all about the gram now. It's all about the beginning on Insta. But uh, there's a very funny cartoon called Fairfax on at the moment, which is a sort of a parody of the youngsters and uh, the social media. Which I'm, I'm finding it, it's a little bit, I mean, it is, it is completely dumb, but it is really um, eye-opening, and if you want to get an insight into uh, young young people's, uh, a parody of young people's lives and how they live their life by being uh, verified uh, or, or aspiring to be verified influencers. And uh, let him go because he's... He's got a big old van there and he wants to get out and then he's full of, you know, you know, people. Lots of people on it probably. I've been in early to work these last few days because um, 
I'm going away for a couple of weeks and so I want to get a thing cracking. We had yesterday <laughs> had a bloke who promised to pay four times, promised to pay over the weekend, didn't pay, wrote me a letter saying that I'd uh, uh, misdiagnosed his misdiagnosed his condition. This is because he came in, said he needed a filling. I said, why don't we try and fill it? He said, all right then. When I took all the decay out, I said, look, you're right. The filling probably not gonna work. It's either a root treatment or an extraction. And he said, well, in that case, I'll, I'll have the original extraction. So we took the tooth out and he left without pain. So I filled in a small claim <laughs> for him yesterday morning, which added 35 pounds to his 56 bill which made it 91 plus five pence interest. And um, and by four o'clock, I'd had a reply from him saying that he was gonna pay. So he then had to ring us up and pay 91 pound and five P over the phone instead of 56. But about which he was royally pissed. But however, it's the fastest small claim I've ever had settled, I must say, I must tell you. Ask me to tell you about the small claims I've made over the years. They're not always entirely successful, but this one was. Now he's paid us 91, but he'll be pissed off because he thinks we added 35 on. Whereas in fact, 35 was what I had to pay to take him to court. So in fact, I have got for my 56 pounds, 56 pounds, plus a load of grief for chasing him up for this money over five days and five pence interest for my pains. So I just did it all for five p. So, <laughs> mind you, it did cheer me up, I've got to say, you know, the ability, the, the, the opportunity to take someone to a small claims court when they royally piss you off like that is, over and a watertight case, is just really, uh, we put the evidence to him and, and, and the fact that he'd offered to pay four times didn't obviously go in his favour, so he just said, oh yeah. He said, I don't, want to, I don't want this going backwards and forwards over it. And we were like, well, if you paid this morning, it would have been 56 quid. It's only because you're paying at four o'clock that it's 91. I mean, it's just, but it's very easy. If anybody owes you any money and, and you figure it's a pretty much open and, open and shut case, then uh, <clears throat> it's not difficult at all, but it does cost you 35 quid. But you get that back and then and you don't have to pay their legal fees even if you lose. So really that's your 35 quid and then you either get the money or you don't, you know. And it's just uh, whether you're throwing good money after bad. Depends on what you've got on them. I mean, we've got, I mean, we've got their name, we've got their date of birth, we've got their address, we've got their email address, we've got their phone number. Do you know what I mean? We've got them banged to rights. It's not like they, they can flit on us. They can't flit. And then we had another lady, I mean, a nice, nice enough lady uh, a very high IQ as she's constantly telling us but a very difficult management problem had to take a tooth out and she's on anticoagulants and I said to her look I'm going to need to see your yellow book I need to see what your INR is she said oh my INR is 2.6 I said okay that's great that's good that's what we want but I said I'll need to see your book why do you need to see my book I've just told you what my INR is so if I tell you what my INR is you don't need to see my book and I'm like I do need to see your book, you know. But that wasn't what the problem was. That was just the last problem we had with her. This time she rings up and says, uh, you know, I've got toothache and I need, to, I need a filling urgently. So uh, Effie, uh, Ellie booked her in and, uh, and, uh, oh, come on, Derek, come on. So Ellie booked her in and then and sent her an invoice for a checkup because she'd not been in for a year. And uh, which is 45 quid, so not even including the cost of the filling if we do it. And uh, she wrote back and she said, oh, why have I been invoiced for something I haven't, didn't ask for and I haven't had done? Now, now we get a bit of that, so I wrote back and I said, look, this is not, you know, the General Dental Council says that I can't get informed consent unless I've explained the options to the patient. And I can't explain the options to a patient unless I've done a checkup. So if I haven't done a checkup, I can't get informed consent. Even if I have looked at the problem and know what the problem is, and and 
you know, know enough to carry out the treatment and you don't want a checkup or to pay for one and I agree that you don't need one. But the General Dental Council says no, you have to any problem has to be looked at in the context of of the mouth and the patient's health overall. Therefore thou shalt do a checkup. So, you know I am not going to fight the General Dental Council on this because I'm not, I'm absolutely not just going to fight them. If they want to make them dicker themselves, then I'm going to let them do it. So, anyway, uh, she wrote back and she said, uh, she said, oh, well, she said, if I'd known it was a ruling from the General Dental Council, then obviously I wouldn't have disputed it. And, uh, um, but, um, you know, seeing as you played such a nasty joke on me last time I came in, I, um, you know, I thought you might have been doing it again. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I don't know. I have not. And honestly, I have not got the first clue what this woman's talking about. I have read her notes last time she came in. It was a perfectly normal checkup, scale and polish for all I can see. And that was it. Nothing about, you know, I told the patient they've got cancer of the mouth and then I said, oh no, or, you know, only kidding, or anything like that. I said to the nurse, <laughs> Lou, I said, Lou, can you understand what this woman is talking about? Can you, can you, have you got any memory or any idea what she might be referring to? And Lou said, no, I have not got a clue. And the only thing I can think is that in the same way, as this bloke decided that he couldn't afford to pay or he didn't want to pay or he got away without paying and he didn't think there's anything I could do about it and so decided to uh, accuse me of uh, a misdiagnosis to try and shut me up and stop me pursuing the, the financial claim. I think that she's decided that uh, the best way for her to explain her actions in terms of uh, in terms of uh, objecting to paying in advance for a checkup, not even the filling, bearing in mind that she's been given, as I say, excellent service. I mean, a filling appointment within two days is like you can't get a filling appointment before February round here. Um, is that is that I played a joke on her last time, and therefore she thought it was a joke. She thought it was a joke. But not because she was an idiot and she thought it might be a joke, but because I'm an idiot and I played a joke on her last time, therefore she was fully justified in thinking it was a joke. Uh, and uh, we'll just gloss over the fact that I never played a joke on any patient in my life. And uh, I don't, I, no, I didn't play a joke on her and none of us knows what she's talking about. So needless to say, she'll be finding another dentist and all patients a lying bastards. Okay, this is just, remember this, you youngsters, and the General Dental Council, who tend to give sort of credence to patients, who come up with this absolute fucking crap, claptrap, rubbish lies, self-serving narrative of their own life. All patients are liars, all right? In this, in you know, self-serving liars, they lie, just in the self-service. Right, I'll uh, talk to you soon. Bye.